Okay, we are moving our way through Daniel and in the last chapter here, uh, we'll be going through chapter 12, verses 5 through 7. And um, I've talked, I think today I kind of titled the message, which I don't usually title the messages all the time, but um, in that God knocks people down so that they might look up and, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times that before we're saved, before we really make a decision for God, uh, we've got to be shook up a little bit. And, um, you know, it always seems like in our lives, whenever uh, we just continue on and do our thing the way we want to do it and, and all that, uh, God's going to send a wake-up call to us that he's got to be able to do that. We don't always want to do everything that's right unless we're made to do it. Uh, that's that sin nature that's in us. Uh, if you don't believe me, then you have not been around small children in a long time, <laughs> whether grandkids or kids or, or whatever. And it'll tell you right quick, uh, they don't do what's good because they want to, they do it because they're told to. And it don't take them long to figure out uh, they, they like doing whatever they want to do. They got that strong will, that rebellious will. And guess what? Uh, we may tame it to some degree, but it continues on in our life all the way to the end, right? That we think we whoop it in one area, then we, it shows up in another area that we're a little rebellious and kind of want to do what we want to do. We get comfortable. Uh, comfortable with everything that we have and this and that, and it's easy to uh, put our trust in uh, our abilities, put our trust in bank accounts, and put our trust in whatever a lot of other things sometimes than god and it seems that whenever things get really bad guess what we run to prayer we run to this please can you pray for this situation or that and you're uh, they start people start showing up in churches and start looking whenever they're put under a little pressure it's just natural right uh, and it just takes that unfortunately that's just part of what we are but it happens that way that sometimes God knocks us down, uh, absolutely allows us to fall, allows things to happen. Not because he's mad at us or whatever, it's because he's wanting to draw us to him. Uh, that's the whole goal is to uh, take all their situations, whatever, the bad ones and all that, and, and to look to him through that. Uh, He's, he's uh, uh, in the business of, of bringing down the strong, right? Knocking down strongholds and promoting the weak and building them up. And we look at Daniel uh, uh, in this, this passage this morning, and we see that as the future program for the nation of Israel. Um, we've been through and we've, we've got this vision that came and uh, we're, we're working through it. We... Uh, we, we looked uh, uh, back a little bit um, that, that in 12 here, we, we've got this vision that, that, that comes to Daniel all the way through 10, 11, and 12. It's all together. And then 12, he's, he's uh, uh, looking at it, and then he asks some questions about it. There's two questions and answers about what it means and all that, which we'll get partly into. And um, we see that in one of his first questions uh, that he that he asked, he's told to, to just seal up the time of the end. We remember we talked about that last week or so that that uh, um, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge will be increased. That that the 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 context of that is we're not talking about travel. We're not talking about running all over, and not talking about space travel, uh, fast cars, and all that kind of stuff. Because that's not the context of the passage. The context of the passage is here's this vision, but it's not for your time. They can't understand it at that time. And uh, so Daniel, you're not going to understand it. Uh, future generations, future people will understand it. The knowledge will be increased. That's what's called progressive illumination. Remember we talked about illumination, not revelation. Revelation has been made. God's sealed the revelation. Here it is, and that's it. They can't understand it. But there's going to be illumination though as it goes through time and time occurs, you'll be able to see it and understand that. Uh, so we have that all the time happening now about every week 
uh, we see something that helps us to understand more in the Bible because the the the, the things of the end times uh, uh, that that are described. We see how it's going to all lay out now. We can see more and more of it every day of how things are going to go. It's, it's, it's understandable now. It's, it's been illuminated now. And uh, so, and as we continue on, we'll, we'll know more and more. Uh, but that is for the time of the end, it said. And that knowledge is going to be increased. Like I say, it's not necessarily all the... We do see knowledge increasing about a, a lot of things, uh, but that's not what this passage is necessarily describing exactly. It's going to be about the times of the end, uh, not medical knowledge and how much we learned in medicine, how much we've learned in engineering or science or technology. It's not about that. It's about uh, understanding and knowing God's, God's word and how it will, will open up to us. And so then we move into to, in Daniel chapter 12. We're moving to verse 5 through 7. It says, Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other, uh, stood other two, the one on the side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. You remember now, it's kind of like a, uh, uh, I feel like I've been watching in movies where they, they show something happening here, and then they kind of go into this big, long story, and then at the end, all of a sudden, you're right back to where you were in the beginning, like this vision, and that's what it is. He's... Remember, he was on the, the banks of the river when we started. And then it took him. We haven't talked about him physically being there on them rivers this whole time. Uh, and then now we're back again. And so uh, Daniel brings us back and say, I, I, I mean, he's coming out of the vision that God gave him. And now he is standing there between the world. Which rivers are those? Well, it's the, the Tigris and the Euphrates is where he's at. He's in central Iraq. Of course, it wasn't Iraq then. But that's where he's at. He's in that area right where uh, Babylon was, and he's right there between those those rivers. And where ba uh, Babylon is today uh, is still there. So he's there. And then one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river or above, uh, he's above them and higher of, he says, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? So Daniel's, you know, the one, the, the, we see these men here that, that are on these rivers. And we're talking about angels here. And he asked another one that's up high but above the other. So there's another one here. It says, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters. And when uh, King James says upon, some of them say above, or whatever it's what it's talking about. It was up above, uh, upon these waters. When he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and he swore by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people all these things will be finished and we've we've been through the time times and half a time before we, we should understand that or daniel's uh, uh, 70 week prophecy and all so we're seeing here some some people uh that that he's seeing and then one is dressed in in white and fine linen that's above uh, these waters that it's above them they have a conversation between themselves asking the other one, when is this going to happen? When is this going to occur? And, uh, and then he lays out uh, uh, what it's going to be, but they're not going to be able to, Daniel's not going to be able to understand this. Uh, we understand it very well now. <laughs> we've, got the, we've got the full counsel of Daniel, and uh, we have the full uh, counsel of John writing Revelation and so many other passages we've got the whole bible so now it's pretty easy for us to figure that out where daniel could not see it at that time and uh he still he's going to have to scatter the power of the holy people and then and then it's going to be finished and um so we see that you know the things that it takes for all of us at some point in time to be saved is that we've got to We've got to get knocked down. I mean, uh, we're, we're like a drug addict, right? They're going to do everything they can to continue on to get drugs and to go on and on and on. They're going to do whatever they got to do. And they're not going to stop. And people that I've dealt with this so many times, they're not going to stop until they hit rock bottom. I mean, they're the bottom of the barrel. They're just 
done. It's just the way it is. Every single one of them, no matter what the issue is with people that are in, in deep rebellion, is they got to hit the end of their rope before they'll ever make that change. I've known people who uh, have, have been on drugs or been alcoholics or whatever, and, and after, after they ruined their entire life, lost their family, lost jobs, lost everything, lost their health, then they finally wake up and, and, and they're able to finally kick the habit. They're finally able to make the change. They've got to get all the way to rock bottom. And I'm going to tell you that for everybody that's saved, all of us had to do that too. Now, it may not have been that bad for each one of us. You see what I'm saying? But at some point in time, we've got to go, okay, the way I'm doing things isn't working. <laughs> I'm going to have to put aside my pride, put aside myself, and God, I'm going to have to give it to you. And, and I believe in you, and I'm going to give my life to you and, and repent of our sins and continue on because this isn't going to work. Every one of us had to come to that at some point in time because that's part of our salvation experience, right? It's part of the belief that goes with it. That repentance is all comes together. Uh, and, and it's all, all together in that package that, that happens. And then here we go. We, we live our lives. Now, we're constantly in our life as a Christian improving. God shows us more things in our life that needs to be changed. You see what I'm saying? He convicts us of sin, and we, we uh, confess that, and we try to get rid of that, and, and, we, and we work through things through the power of the Holy Spirit that God has given us, and He changes us on the inside. He causes changes inside of us, and we're not the same person. We're born again. We're changed, but we still got that sinful nature that, that drags us around a little bit, and sometimes we... We like it and we give in to it, right? <laughs> we will let the sinful nature take control. Um, and we're going to see, see that. It takes that. And so uh, we will see that there's, there's a future program for the nation of Israel that he's going to do. Um, so uh, uh, we see all this that's occurred, all this that's, that's coming to us, and... Um, we know that, that as we talked before, uh, most all the things that Daniel has seen are historical from our perspective, right? They've already happened. They've already occurred. Antiochus IV come and hit Jerusalem, you know, in the temple in, in the Maccabean period between the Testaments, and all these things have happened. We have the... the uh, 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 AD 70, uh, the, the, the dispersal, we've had, we've had all those things, and we, we said that it comes up to about uh, verse 35 in chapter 11, and then there's a change to where we're looking forward. You can tell immediately as you read that something has changed, we're talking about something different, something future. And he talks about it and he begins to describe this tribulation period and the millennial kingdom which follows. Uh, he's, get, we, he's given information about the Antichrist and, and then the tribulation and then that millennial kingdom that's going to occur. Um, so he's been, he's been given this, this description uh, of the end times. And we've seen the suffering of Israel uh, the, uh, and, and we see that it's yet future. Uh, there's going to be, uh, for them, there's going to be a, a separation. Uh, there's the two great resurrections that we talked about at the end of the age, the, the, the uh, uh, rapture as a resurrection, and then the resurrection at the uh, end of the millennial kingdom. And there's going to be a reward for those that are resurrected that some people receive and, and some won't. Those are the things that, that we talked about. But as we're moving, moving forward in this, um, we see that, that uh, uh, this one is, is what we're going to look at today, this question and answer uh, session here that they've had. We've asked questions when it's going to happen, and then this answer that, that he's given them back. And so um, as we look at this, um, it's important to know that, again, that Daniel has, has written this, that he... He says, uh, then I, Daniel, um, in the scripture. And, and why is that a big deal? Because everything that you look at in secular history, secular uh, TV, uh, 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 teachers and all that, and Bible teachers today, if you watch anything on, on uh, uh, Discovery Channel or any of those things like that, Daniel, all this had happened way uh, uh, later, and Daniel just writing history. He's not writing about the future. He's writing about something everything's already happened. 
uh, this, this happened at a different time is what they're trying to say. And, and that's on everything, every time they come up. So it's, it's, we may understand it, but like I say, our kids, our grandkids, they may understand because it it's going to tell us that uh, Daniel just wrote history. Uh, none of this was prophecy. Uh, he was just writing down what's already happened uh, a few hundred years before, earlier. That's all he's doing. He's a historian. But even Jesus says uh, 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 that he quotes Daniel 9, 27. And he says, spoken through the prophet of Daniel. He indicates that Daniel wrote this, and that he wrote it as it happened. And so that's important to know and understand that, that uh, this is a, a, a prophecy that's going to, to be coming uh, to be. Daniel, Matthew, or, uh, Jesus in Matthew 24, 15 says, Therefore you see the abomination of desolation which is spoken of through Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place. Let the reader understand. He's talking about what Daniel said and who that is. He quotes him and he puts that future for the Israelites to follow. He, he quotes that exactly. Um, that's how come we know all this. Jesus is a great commentator. I think he's pretty accurate, wouldn't you think so? <laughs> if we're going to think that that uh, uh, the abomination of desolation, how we talked about that, is going to occur at some point in time, if Jesus said that, then I probably believe it, that he's, that it's going to happen exactly as he says. And so so we see this. But we got these two uh, to people here that are standing on the river, on the, these banks of the river, and um, we had talked about before um, uh, one of them is, is, is uh, well, it was really about the doctrine of angels and, and all that, um, that I believe is going to be uh, uh, Gabriel that's there. Because Gabriel was, was and right over here, he's the one that's taking care of the, the Israelites. He's the one that brings them messages and, and all that. Um, some of them put this as, well, it's got to be Jesus. By the way they're dressed, it's got to be a, a theophany, which is a, a pre-incarnate Jesus there. And that's okay if, if, if we think that. Uh, I, I really believe what I read here is, is probably just Gabriel. Um, he's a very powerful angel. He may be dressed similar, and there are similar descriptions to him and Jesus in Revelation, but not word for word, not completely. And so uh, I really believe it's Gabriel because Gabriel has been through the whole story uh, and he is the one that's basically his job is to uh, speak to the Israelites and bring them uh, uh, this prophecy and to speak to them and all that. The second thing is, is if it's the same one, then this person also we talked about had to come through uh, Persia and fight the prince of Persia, a fallen angel, demonic angel that's over the, the country of Persia. He had to fight him for 21 days. And I can't see uh, Jesus Christ having to fight any other entity for 21 days. Um, the, the, it just doesn't exist. Uh, God has absolute full control of, of the angels. Fallen angels are good angels. It doesn't matter. He has full control of Satan. Satan can't do anything that he does not allow. Uh, Satan's got to come and I think uh, he'll ask God's permission to do stuff. Um, he, he's, he's like a dog on a leash. He's not doing anything that he isn't allowed to do. Um, God has absolute full control over him uh, still. Uh, uh, you know, he rebelled against God. God allowed him to do that. And he brought down a third of the angels with him. But I don't believe that Jesus would have to, to, to do that. Now I understand that he wrestled and fought Jacob. You know, there was a, that, there, but there's a reason for that. There's a theological reason that comes out of that. Uh, that that uh, that is there. That is a lesson there, but not fighting another fallen angel for 21 days. But either way, it's not something worth starting a whole new church over, and, and uh, or an argument. Of, either way, um, we're we're going by the best thing that we can here uh, on these on these angels. But we see that um, this is this is going to be between the Tigris and the Euphrates. That's uh, uh, the Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia actually means between the rivers. That's the name of it. Uh, you can look even now on maps, it'll say Mesopotamia all in that area around there in Iraq. It's right there between the Tigris and the Euphrates. And uh, of course, we know that the Euphrates is, is a special river. That's one that will be dried up at the time, the end of Revelation, with all the, the kings and the 200 million man army comes across that river, it's going to be dried up and loud so they can come across. 
and uh, that's already occurring even now. It's, it's way smaller than it used to be. But that's the location uh, where it's at. The other is that we see these, these uh, angels that are giving this information uh, uh, to him and, uh, and understanding uh, uh, what's going on uh, to, to be able to tell his people what's happening. Um, the thing is, as we talked about before, that's so important about Daniel is really how to live for God in this pagan world and how to stand for God in this pagan world. Uh, Ezekiel was uh, a prophet of the exile during that time. They were contemporaries, uh, but we don't know if they actually knew each other or met each other or anything like that. They certainly knew of each other and their reputations, but we don't understand their relationship. But Ezekiel uh, references Daniel uh, in Ezekiel 14, and then in chapter 28, he's making reference to Daniel. And so e Ezekiel knew Daniel at least by reputation. And uh, they understand and, and knew uh, what was going on. Um, I want you to understand that all this stuff that, that's so important that tells about these actual geophysical places and, and, and geopolitical places and all that, that this actually happened, this actually here. You can actually learn a lot about geography just by studying the Bible, that this is something that can be tracked and, and know. There's so many stories and some other uh, uh, books and other things out there that you can't, you can't track. It, it is, it's made up. Uh, there, there's nothing uh, there. It doesn't exist. But the Bible is absolute history, and it tells it exactly as it was in these locations that that it happened and it's always specific that's what's so good about the bible about prophecy it's always so specific and puts details in there that a lot of times you wonder well why do i need that well the reason is because when you go to try to check the uh, fact check that prophecy you'll know it's absolutely true because of the locations come up exactly right they do uh, archaeological digs there and, and sooner or later they find evidence of it to back up what the Bible has says and uh, and we find that so uh, um, we, we see see these people there the, between the two rivers and and they're talking uh, to, to Daniel and the thing is is, is uh, 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 they have the one clothed in, in linen clothed in white and he's above the waters and it's interesting to see that one of them asked him how long shall it be to the end of these wonders this is something that we need to understand. Um, even the angels don't know everything that's going on. Okay, they are not omniscient. Only God is. God is. When I say omniscient, that means all knowing. He knows every single thing. Isaiah forty six ten tells us that from the beginning, God already knew the ending. He sees it all at once. He is outside of time. He is outside of. Of everything that we have, he is outside of that of what we experience. And so we live in such a linear fashion. We got just a little bit of lifetime, then we're here and we're gone and all that. But God sees it from the beginning to the end, to the complete end. And uh, uh, he, he sees that. But the angels don't know everything. Not everything has been revealed to them. Everything's been revealed to the Son, but not to the angels. And the same way with those that are fallen angels and Satan. Satan is not all-knowing. Sometimes we give him powers that he doesn't have. And to think, you know, he, he understands a lot more than me and you. I can promise you that. He, he, he's lived it, you know. When you talk to older folks that have lived history and you've got an opinion about something, uh, uh, maybe historical, might not be exactly right from what you've read to what someone who actually lived through it. Uh, Satan has been here from the beginning of the, when the earth and the universe was made, according to Job. And so they understand and know a lot of things, but they don't know the whole program of God and what it's going to. And even the angels don't. It's just like a military general. Uh, somebody at the top may know more, but the others don't know as much. Uh, you know, when my son gets deployed, he may know an idea kind of where he's going or what, kind of what they're doing. They give him a general idea, but they're not going to tell him everything. They're not going to know up until the last minute of what they're doing, and that's just the way it is. Um, and these angels know that something's going to happen. They don't know when. Satan knows that he's going to have a short time. He's going to have some things. He knows uh, what we know from the Bible. He can 
read it as good as us. He's been there through the whole making of it. But he doesn't know when. Nobody knows. Uh, uh, only God knows. Even when, uh, 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 you know, uh, Jesus is talking about uh, when he's going to be coming back. Uh, you know, at the time when he was on earth, he said, no one knows. Uh, not even, only the Father, not even the Son, not the angels, no one knows. Uh, now, I'm telling you that Jesus knows now. He is with the Father, seated at the right hand of the Father. But in his humanly self, when he was here on earth, that was not revealed to him as, as a man that, that uh, when he would be coming back. Um, and I say the angels don't know that for sure. Don't know when it's going to happen. Satan doesn't know when that will occur. Um, he's, he's having to do uh, uh, whatever, whatever he can. So... Um, we see see here what's what's happening, and that, that they have to ask. And it's real interesting, you know. Angelology is is an interesting subject to really understand and and know about angels and stuff. But to know that that they don't know, and they have to ask someone else. And the Bible talks about them uh, also. That's very interested into what we're doing. Um, that they they look and they watch us, and and they they see what we're doing. Um, I have to understand, angels do not understand grace the way that we do. They have never experienced grace. They don't have that. Jesus died for us. We are created higher than the angels. Uh, we're going to one time end up judging angels. But uh, we can understand and know the grace of God that he has died for our sins and and, and paid for our sins so we might live forever with him. That's an a, unbelievable thing. And, and they, don't, they don't see that. And they see God continually taking care of us and doing things. And their messengers are sent by God. Uh, and and uh, they may be involved in a lot of that. But they are they're there. Uh, 1 Peter 1.12 said it was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves. But you in these things which now have been sentenced or announced to you through those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Um, as you know that, angels are students. Uh, they stoop down and observe with great care what's happening in the church age, that they, they, they see what's going on. Because in the church, we have this great work of grace that God has done for us, and, and they have not experienced. They've witnessed it, but they have not experienced that. Um, those that, that uh, we have two sections of angels those that are joined with Satan and rebelled against God and they're, they're, they're for, uh, forever cursed their, their fate is sealed it's done and then you have those that did not uh, we, we know that it's a third of the angels that fell with, with Satan so there's two thirds that are doing exactly what God wants them to do they have some amount of free will but they have chosen not to to, uh, uh, to rebel against God. Um, and uh, uh, they understand his creative power. You know, they were there, it seems, when God brought heaven and earth into existence. Job tells us in, in 38, 4 through 7, it says, uh, where were you? He's talking to Job. These are some really good passages where he uh, lines out Job and, and being too proud and all that. And he asked him uh, in, in a, uh, a, a way, he says, uh, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Like Job wasn't even created yet, but he's like, well, where were you? Since you know so much, where were you at? He said, tell me if you have understanding. Who set its measurements since you know? Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. This is, this is a, uh, a, 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 a term here that, that's, that's taken figuratively of the morning stars. And I'm talking about actually the stars singing. Uh, he's talking about the, those of the, 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 the angels and those that were created at the time when, when this was done. They were shouting for joy of what, what he was being created. And uh, so they were, they were there from, from the get-go. Uh, they understand that holiness of God. Um, they, they understand that completely. We know the, the, the seraphim um, uh, that are in there, they, they say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They say it continually before the throne. Uh, they also said that in Isaiah chapter 6. 
uh, talking about about the seraphim and giving them that they say holy holy is the lord of hosts and the whole earth is full of his glory so they understand and, and they know that but they don't understand everything they don't know everything which is like I say interesting because you have this one here that's having to ask the other and asking this question because they don't have that omniscience that all knowingness that god has um, uh, you know of course today it's all about trying to sometimes all about trying to be with the angels we've got these programs that we've had in the past you know touched by an angel and all that and you just got to pray to angels some of them are really heavy into angel worship and and uh trying to get uh, ideas and news from angels and and all that well we don't seem like we can go to god we'll just go to an angel maybe it'll be cheaper maybe it'll be better or something and and it's ridiculous uh we have the ability to go straight to the throne of god and that is something that the angels do not experience and do not understand that that he has given us uh, through the through the uh, sacrifice of, of Jesus. So um, anyway, um, we see that as as it as it uh, uh, changes, and he and he goes into it and he says uh, um, he says how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And and then this man in, in linen, this one that's above the waters, this this and I like to say I think it's probably Gabriel. Uh, some there's been some commentators a lot of them say that and some say well this could be jesus either way i wouldn't arm wrestle nobody over it but like i say it's been gabriel consistently through the book and i assume that it's gabriel because he raises up his right hand and this is the way that you swore an oath then is you'd raise a hand up and swear an oath but when you were to raise both hands up that was a, a very, very solemn oath that you would bring both hands up to God. And this man brings them both up to heaven and he swears by him that liveth forever and ever. Well, God is not going to swear by God. Jesus is not going to be swear by, by Jesus. To me, it's that to me it's even more proof. This is an angel that says, I'm swearing by God. I can I can say this that uh, by the one who lived forever and ever and that's that's god himself and he tells them the time that'll be a time times and a half or or a time times of, and, and half a time that this is going to occur when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people now let me tell you something uh, we understand and know from Daniel because this Daniel 70 week prophecy that we talked about in Daniel 9 27 all that there is seven more years left on that clock okay we talked about that the clock that goes goes to the 69th week and it has stopped and it will not pick up again until the time that the Antichrist goes into the or excuse me until he confirms that covenant uh, that he's going to confirm with Israel. And so we understand that's the beginning point of the tribulation. But that clock has stopped for Israel. And they didn't understand this back in the Old Testament. Because the church age was what? It was a mystery. They didn't understand. It wasn't revealed until, uh, uh, well, Jesus told Peter, said, upon this rock, build my church but church it's one of the first times we heard church now we know synagogue we know kingdom and all this but now he's talking about a church um, that's new and we know that that was introduced with jesus there's going to be a church and then we understand more um, uh, with the uh, uh, upper room discourse uh, John 14, 1 through 4. He says, In my house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. And when he says, I go to prepare a place for you, uh, and he's going to come and he's going to receive us to himself, that where we will, he is at, we will be. And so uh, uh, that's the first hint that there's going to be a rapture, that there's going to be a church age. And the church age started with Pentecost. And now we've been in the church age for what a little maybe two thousand years close to it maybe a little less actually if we we were looking at the dates but we've been in that church age and so that 69th week has has stopped and it won't pick up again and he tells them how much time he has we know that it begins from daniel when he confirms the covenant with his people and uh, we talked about that. I, I really believe that's going to be the Abrahamic covenant because of the, the definite article. He calls it the 
covenant, every Bible translation that you can find calls it the covenant, not just a covenant, not just a peace treaty. It may be an Abraham Accord as we have today, maybe all these Abraham Accords, all these other countries, but it's some type of covenant that says you have the right to be in your land. And I really believe that as, as we go further and further along, that's the big question, that's the big thing, is Israel don't have a right to be there, we need to get them out of there, push them out to the sea, run them out, we can't allow them to build no houses there, you know, things that you would never ask another country or, or get on them about, about building houses, but that, that's the whole deal, it's a big stumbling block, this, this uh, heavy stone Jerusalem is and Israel to all the nations and stuff. But he's going to confirm that, and we know that when he does, that is the beginning. We learn that from Daniel, others, that that's going to be the beginning of that seven-year tribulation with, with them. But it's not necessarily going to be tribulation for the Israelites. We understand from Daniel that their part is really three and a half years. That's when the Antichrist really comes to full power, and he has over them is that midpoint. So that's the midpoint of the tribulation. And the Bible talks about that as, as uh, 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 1260 days or 42 months, uh, time, times and a half a time. That's a time of three and a half years that we can infer from that. It's time of, of three and a half years. And we know that in the midpoint exactly is when he kills the two witnesses, goes into the temple, desecrates it. He's acting out the prefigurement of Antiochus IV. Remember that we talked about when he went in and desecrated the temple and slaughtered a hog in there and all this stuff. But this new guy goes in and desecrates it, sets himself up uh, to be worshipped. I'm God, you know, and tells the Israelites that and then they figure out that the gig is up. This guy isn't who we thought he was. Uh, but he does that and he knows then. And why does he say that? Because he tells uh, 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 Satan then knows that that he has uh, only a little time okay revelation disappeared <laughs> let me find it <laughs> there it is um we know that he didn't have a little time in revelation uh chapter 12 We, we see this, uh, 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 it's talking about, about the, the uh, 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 it says that Lucifer, angel, the Satan is, is cast out of, of heaven. There's a time that's going to occur when he's going to be completely cast out of heaven. Now, Satan still has access to heaven, okay? He has the ability to go. He's, he's the, he's, he has access to God like we have access to God. He knows where he's at all the time. I'm going to tell you that um, I'm, I'm different in, in some things about, uh, like in Job, uh, when, when uh, the, the uh, sons of God come to present themselves to God, that is something that happens all the way through the Old Testament. That's not the only occurrence that happens over and over again. They were required to present themselves before God. So let me, let me jump there right fast and make a little bit more sense here. But uh, in verse, you know, verse 1, he comes to God. The sons of God come before God because they are required to present themselves before God. This is the saved people on earth. Um, the, the sacrificial system started back under uh, uh, Cain and Abel, remember? Uh, they were bringing their sacrifices. Of course, Cain wasn't doing what he ought to do, and he was rebelling, and he got mad at Abel and killed him. So we don't know if all the whole Noah... Uh, uh, law was in effect yet yeah, but there still was sacrificial system and all that from the get go God laid that out when he killed the first animal to cover Adam and Eve with animal skins I mean, that's, guess what here's the sac first sacrifice got to die for your sin and, uh, and then it continued on through that so they come and they present themselves they're required by law to present themselves before the Lord and uh, uh, there's, there's tons of scriptures over and over again where they come to present themselves before the Lord all the time, before the priest, which is still before the Lord when they came before the priest, or they come before the tabernacle or to the temple. That term, coming before the Lord or presenting themselves before the Lord, is a common term all the way through the Old Testament, not just in Job. Um, uh, most people say, well, they had to go to heaven. That's where the, the idea of sons of God got to be angels because all this took place in heaven. I'm telling you, and I may be wrong, maybe I'm crazy, 
Now, I'm just saying, because I'm different from everybody else probably on this. I don't think that's in heaven. I think it's right here on earth. God's here on earth too. <laughs> He's not just in heaven. When you pray, you don't go to heaven and talk to him directly. You're praying right here. And they're coming, bringing their sacrifice, presenting themselves before the Lord. And Satan is along with them. Because he's been cast down to the earth. He's here. But he has the ability to go right to God and talk to him and say, hey, uh, how about this? Remember in G uh, uh, during Jesus' time when he asked about Peter? He said, I want to sift him like wheat. Like I say, which to me is the most scariest thing in the world you could ever <laughs> determine is Satan asking God to sift you personally like wheat. Whoo, I don't want to be there. You know, that's not what I want. But he's able to talk to him and say that. He's able to do that. And so, so, so we see that. And, and, and we see here that, that uh, uh, it says that the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them to present himself before the Lord. I think God requires his presence and requires him to come to him and check on him every now and then. He goes there all the time. The New Testament tells us he's always there to accuse us, right? And to, and to uh, uh, point out every little wrong thing he can before God and say, look here, look here, look here. And we know that we have an advocate, right? The Father, the Jesus Christ, our advocate, he's our defense attorney. He said, no, I got it covered. I got it covered by my blood. But we see that and they, they, they come before that. And now in, in Revelation, at this point, that point is Satan is completely cast out from the presence of God. And now he knows that he has such little time uh, to be able to, to, to do what he's got to do. And it's talking about this in that, in that story um, where there's this war in heaven. Michael, Michael, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought the angels and prevaileth not. Neither was there a place found anymore in heaven. He's cast out. He's the old servant called the devil, which deceiveth the whole world. He's cast onto the earth, and his angels are cast out with him. It says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. The kingdom of God is the key there. It says, For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And that's what he had been has been doing and will do until that point in time. And he's He's cast out. And then it goes on as you, as you go down to, to uh, uh, verse 13. It says, And when the dragon saw he was cast up onto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man child. And the woman were given two wings, the great eagle, and were flying to the wilderness and a place where she is nourished for a time, times and a half a time. Uh, from the face of the serpent. That is when, according to Zechariah, they, they run in Matthew chapter 24 uh, when all this occurs it happens all at once in the middle of the tribulation. He's cast out. He's on the earth and he's, he's coming with a vengeance and, and that is also the time when he actually enters into the Antichrist. That's when he possesses him. Why do I say that? I think it's clear from the Bible. There's only two people in the Bible that's ever been described ever as the son of perdition or the man of perdition. Who is that? Judas, right? It was described and, and that's when Satan entered into Judas uh, and, and Jesus told him as soon as he entered him, go do. What you're, what's, what you're going to do, do quickly. Do it. Because he couldn't do it until he had permission. <laughs> I think that's great, you know. Satan couldn't go deceived. He couldn't go uh, uh, do what he wanted to do. He couldn't do anything. He entered Judas, but Judas couldn't do anything because until Jesus says, you can go now. <laughs> and you can, uh, you can uh, 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 and, and betray me as he, as he did. But he, he is there and he knows now. That's the only point that he knows that he's going to have a time, time and a half. That he's got three and a half years. And that's why when the Bible talks about him turning the pressure on him, he's really going to turn it on him. Like I say, Zechariah talks about that. He's going to kill two-thirds of the, the, the Israelis today. He's going, to, he's going to take them out and a third is going to run. Remember Matthew chapter 24, run, go. They're going to go and they're going to be protected by God miraculously. And then they will have a promise they will get a promise that absolutely no other nation on this earth has ever been promised. And that is that he's going to save Israel. 
Now we're talking about a national revival. We have had revivals. There's been the Great Awakening and been others. But there is nothing in Scripture that is absolutely promised to the nations of a full, complete revival. Not the United States, <clears throat> not Canada, not whoever. Uh, Europe, whatever. Great Britain, I don't care what you put in there. Australia, nothing has ever happened. But there is a promise that he will take Israel and save every single person in it. You know, old folks, young folks, everybody uh, together uh, uh, will be saved uh, through Israel. And um, they're going to be saved. And that's the time. That's what it's going to have to take for them. Um, let me catch up on my notes here. I always get to go on and preach past my notes and then they got to catch up. Um, but uh, uh, the problem with, with uh, uh, everything now in Israel is the same problem that really all of us have. They're rich. They don't need anything. Where, where do they put their trust today? Where do they put their trust? In the IDF? The Iron Dome? Their own genius and smartness that they have? The unbelievable technology? The money they continually increase their GDP every year. Always. 7% or more every, every year. It's just continual. Um, and and uh, uh, they've got everything. Let's look at a little bit right quick. We've talked a little bit about it before. Um, but Ezekiel 38 39 is, is a, a couple of chapters that I do want to uh, preach on and go through detail. But in Ezekiel 38 and 11, it describes all these nations that are right now, every one of them camped out all around Israel, ready to go <laughs> to invade them. Um, and they have to have a reason to invade. Uh, and it talks about that. It says, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I'll go against to those who are rest, that live securely. All of them living without walls or no bars or gates that they are going to be able to take care of themselves. And, and, uh, and they can. Uh, they have skirmishes, and there's, there's, they send some missiles and little things, but they take care of business, right? Who would have guessed in 1948 that they would have been able to, to win and become a nation? Or 1967, that they would be able to overcome that. Or 1973, that was during Nixon's reign uh, term here when uh, uh, they called and said, I, I need it. And remember, I told you that was a, a thing that even Nixon said that his, his mom told him a long time ago that it came to him that if Israel ever asked for help, that you would do it. And uh, he said that that's, he even said that, that, that he knew that that was why he was even president was just that one reason to be able to help Israel. He, he deduced it down. That was his, his words that, uh, that would do that and, and they give them help and save uh, Israel through 67. But who would have put money on them then? And, and they're always the underdog. They're always that. And, and through, through everything that they're able to do, they're able to, to, to thwart everything. And so that's pretty easy to say, well, I've done all this. Look at what we've done. We have the Seventh most powerful nation in the world is Israel. They're extremely powerful. They got nuclear capabilities and they're continually on into everything and continuing stuff. They have the greatest economy. I'd say it continues to grow all the time. Um, right now, with a population of about 7 million people in Israel, the, uh, I was looking this up. And, and uh, the, 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 the newest thing that I could find, it said as of 2021, uh, Israel has 71 billionaires in Israel. Out of 7 million people, they got 71 uh, billionaires. And uh, then it says, as, as, uh, which that puts it, as the, the highest per capita rates in the world. It's basically 6.7 billionaires for every million people. And then uh, 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 the other thing about that is, is out of the millionaires that are there, there's 105,000 millionaires. And, and uh, uh, that's unbelievable. Out of all of those, um, 105,000 out of 7 million, they're very wealthy and, and they've done very well. Israel's GDP is about double or almost double than any other Middle Eastern country. Um, 
even the, the value of the minerals in the Dead Sea is estimated to be five trillion dollars that, that are there. Um, they remember they discovered gas, and this is old news, but uh, in 2010 they, they discovered this natural gas, and of course they're providing gas and everything now, all up on their northern coastline. And even then is when they discovered oil, they haven't got that out of the ground yet, but it's the Royal Dutch Shell, um, the Scheffler Basin, holds the world's second largest shale deposits outside the United States, from which around 250 billion uh, barrels of oil, about the same as Saudi Arabia's proven reserves, uh, the estimates of global deposits range from 2.8 trillion to 3.3 trillion recoverable barrels of oil that is discovered there. Now it's in a, uh, and that's in a pretty hospitable location, and it's all the uh, uh, light, sweet crude that we like that's easily, easily uh, 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 refined into gasoline and all the other uh, common products, and uh, they've always proven to be the best at exploiting resources. Uh, they, they have uh, 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 utilized drip irrigation where they get water from air and, and uh, to be able to take care of plants even in the, in the desert. And they help export that to other, other uh, communities that are in the desert. Um, they've been able to do this and they see that there. Now the, 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 this oil, they say, is uh, this strata is about 350 meters thick and um, and, and said so this that's what's important is the thickness and the porosity on average the world strata is 20 to 30 meters thick so this is 10 times as large as that and so, so we're talking about significant qualities this is a, a reading from the article uh, and it says the important thing to know that the oil is in the rock and that's what we know now three drillings have taken place so far and they have these billions of barrels of oil that they've discovered and all they can do is more fracking and and other ways that the technology they have to be able to get that out. And that's where they're at now, is, is developing uh, the, the way to get that out. They know it's there. A lot of places there's oil, but they can't get it out. Well, now we've seen in the last several years, uh, the, the thing of fracking and all that, be able to get oil back out of those areas. And so you see that all of a sudden, that wasn't, <laughs> you know, that, that wasn't a thing many years ago. Um, how, how did they get that from, from nothing? Um, I got a, a description here that uh, Mark Twain said, it's in his book, The Innocents Abroad, uh, that he had written, and uh, this is his description when he went through, um, it was the middle 1800s, and I can't remember the date, but it, it, when he went through there, and uh, he said it was a desolate country whose soil is rich enough, but is given, holy, uh, uh, given over wholly to weeds. A silent, mournful expanse. A desolation is here that not even imagination can grace with the pomp of life and action. We never saw a human being on the whole route. There was hardly a tree or shrub anywhere. He said, even the olive tree and the cactus, those fast friends of a worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. Now, they wouldn't even hardly live there. That's how bad it was. And that's not been that long ago. That was in 48. I mean, that was in the 1800s, but it wasn't any different when they finally took over. And slowly, as the Bible said, there'll be streams in the desert and it will bloom. The deserts will bloom. God will take care of that land and his people that are there. But do you think they see that and understand that? Unfortunately, they don't. Um, they're, they're in that, that they have all this strength they have all this money, they have all this ability, and that's where their trust lies in, is that. All about that. They're going to be able to do all of these things, and, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's where it's at. That's them, but are we any different? Are we any different? We're here in the United States. I mean, we can do about anything we want. We can pretty much eat whatever we want. We are complaining this morning about the price of groceries and some things not being able to be found, but we're still, we're still doing real well, you know. But how easy it is to put our trust into our military, put our trust into our bank account, put our trust into everything else, and not realize what God has provided for us and how we ought to be thankful for that and that that can be gone uh, in an instant. 
God's always doing that. And he's got to knock people down in order to, to get them there. This is what's so important that I have such a, a, a problem with with those that either want to continue to put the church in the tribulation period um, and, and, and put us about that. It's not about us. It's about Israel. We're, we're, people are putting us into someone else's place. You cannot find a tribulation passage anywhere in the Bible that describes the church in it. Anywhere. No one can find it. It doesn't exist. It's not there. Why is that? It's because the church isn't there. Uh, we aren't destined uh, uh, to wrath. Uh, we, we, are, uh, uh, we avoid wrath. Uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, uh, 5 Uh, 9 says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, we are uh, uh, going to avoid uh, wrath. We, we don't have that. Um, it's not going to happen and occur. Um, we, we don't have to go through that. The other thing is, 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 the, is Daniel talks about here, is he's not shattering the people. We know from Revelation that the Antichrist comes against the elect, which is those that are saved during that time, not the church. The church is gone, but he comes against them and he's able to prevail against them. He, he wins. He starts winning. He's, he's killing Christians left and right. There's not much protection. In fact, the Bible doesn't, doesn't describe any protection really for Christians. Um, he describes protection for, this, for Israel. But... Now, the, Jesus says, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, right? Because he's going to protect and take care of the church all the way through no matter what. You know where the, probably now, the, there have been several reports, the fastest growing church, the fastest growing part of where the church is growing at in the world. The, now, we're not talking about Houston, Texas. And we're not talking about somewhere in California in a mega church. We're talking about the fastest church that's growing. It's in Iran. That's where it's happening. There's more and more Christians being saved in Iran where they are put under iron fist all the time. They're persecuted, something terrible, but it's growing. And it bothers the Ayatollahs. It makes them nervous. But that's where the fastest growing church is. It's not in uh, all these uh, uh, fog lights and you know, lay uh, you know, type of churches here. That's not the fastest ones. It's in Iran that's actually growing right now through persecution and all that. He's going to, what I'm trying to say is the church prevails all the way through. But when the church is removed from the earth through the rapture, the Antichrist comes and he's able to prevail against them. He's able to win and start, start wearing them down. And he's going to come against Israel. And unfortunately, that's, that's just it. It says in, in, in uh, Daniel, in verse 7, it says that it is important here that he said he gives them the time, how long it's going to be. He's got three and a half years that he's going to, he's going to be coming after them. And he said, when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people. He's not scattering the people. He's not destroying them. They're running for safety and they're going to be uh, protected by God, but he's scattering the power of the holy people. And he said, and then all these things shall be finished. And that's what God does, is he sometimes has to scatter our power. He's got to get a hold of us, and he's got to get a hold of Israel. How many of them are being saved now? Not a lot. There's a few, but not many. You can't hardly argue someone into to being saved, uh, uh, Israel. You just can't do it. And it's because of the, the veil the, 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 that's across their eyes, the, the unbelief that's there. There's consequences for, for what they have done. And they, they can't see it. Um, if you uh, tell them something about, about what uh, God does or Jesus, what if they go to the rabbi and they, they get another something completely different, something wild, and they say, well, I want to hear it. I don't want to talk to you. Uh, I've listened to, uh, there's those that do get saved and they're trying to convert them, but they're not going to convert them. Uh, they may get a few here and there, but they're not going to get the whole bunch. But there will be a time when that will happen. 
But listen to a guy, he was reading him Isaiah 53, a rabbi. He was, he, oh yeah, yeah, he was, he thought that was the greatest thing until he made the connection exactly, proving it as Paul would do, proving that he was the Messiah. And then he just, I don't want to hear that. He backed up and took off. I, he just, I he didn't want to hear it. He just took off running. He did not want to hear it. That's that spiritual blindness that's there. And unfortunately, that's the way it's going to be. Just like us in a lot of ways, we've got to be, got to be pounded a little bit. We've got to go through some things, unfortunately. Um, you know, my dad always told me, he said, you got to hit him with a head with a two by four to get him woke up once in a while to do what he ought to do. You know, that's kind of the way it was, stubborn and rebellious. And all of us are to some degree, and God's got to do that to wake us up. But we usually do it right away. But Israel won't, and they're not going to be able to do that. He's going to have to shatter their self-sufficiency. All this stuff that they put their trust in, all the money, all the things, and all the great things that they have, but where they put that in there, it's going to be shattered, going to be destroyed. They believe that the Antichrist is going to be their Messiah. They think he's going to be it. He's the greatest thing in the world. He's come in, he's protecting them. He's allowing them to build the temple. Or at least somehow, somebody's building the temple. All that's functioning and working and everything's going. And he's the greatest thing in the world. To the other parts of the world, he might not be. But to Israel, he is until he goes in and does what he does. But it's just like anything else. You're not going to get an addict. They're not going to change on a whim. They're not going to change until uh, uh, their power is shattered. And that's just all there is to it. Uh, that's the way it's got to go uh, uh, for them. But he is, that's the one that, that has, has uh, uh, Israel is the one who has been given uh, that opportunity uh, to be able to be saved. And the Bible talks about that. It's when the, they will not... Uh, recognize Jesus as Lord and as their Savior and as Messiah until they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And when he does, it's when Jesus finally comes and the Bible strives that every single person of Israel will be saved. And when that happens, that's when the millennial kingdom will begin. And as we go further into the 12, we'll talk about the 1260 days and then there's a couple other days there there's 45 days or some other days we'll get in detail about uh, but we will talk about the end of that and how it is set up and what time it takes for that uh, uh, millennium to occur and for it to come in but that's what it takes um, I would say today if you're in that position and you've been rebelling against God and putting him off and putting him off don't wait till he has to to destroy your power and scatter it and, and cause everything issue. Go and, and give your life to Christ today. Don't wait. And then as Christians, you know, we, we've allowed sin and all to come into our life and it, maybe it's time that we ask God to, to open our hearts to that and, and be able to see that and recognize that, convict us of us and have us do what God wants us to do. You know, uh, become more uh, 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 as what He wants us to be. A stronger Christian to increase our, our uh, uh, relationship with him to be able to come together with him that's 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 the important part is, is our relationship with him and that we we build that and continue on we will see that um, that's that's uh, uh, we see it here so what's happening then it's also going to happen to us um, but we don't have to allow that to happen. We don't have to allow our power to be scattered. We can, we can live that life with Christ right now today and giving our lives over to Him. So that's the call. That's the call today. That's the, uh, how it's relevant to our lives today. It's just like as they live and as they are, we are the same. Let's uh, go to the Lord for prayer. Father, we thank You for Daniel and we thank You for all that we have here that describes what's going to occur in the future. And Father, we, we understand that. We wish maybe it wasn't that way, but Father, that's the way it's going to be. I pray, Father, that we can see that example and understand it, and that we're quickened in our hearts, that we should give our lives over to you without waiting till the time that, that we're having to be really put under pressure to be able to give our lives to you. Father, we just uh, thank you for the examples that we have through your word. I pray, Father, just uh, uh, allow this word to permeate into our hearts 
and to make a difference in our lives. Father, we love you for all that you do for us. I pray for our protection throughout this week. I pray, Father, for an opportunity for us to be able to share the gospel with someone this week. Uh, Lord, that you continually bring people in our paths and on our way that we might be able to, to share about you and give our lives to you. Father, we thank you and we love you. We give you praise and all that you're going to do. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Page 316.